If you're a Christian and you're struggling with a chronic anxiety disorder, you've probably asked the question, why me? What is wrong with me? Everybody else in church seems to be rejoicing freely. Why am I stuck struggling with anxiety? I'm Jamie Eckert and I share biblical content for Christians who are struggling with doubt, obsessions, and anxiety. And today I would like to share a short devotional on Psalm 23 that I think helps us answer this question. Psalm 23 is one of the most beautiful passages in the entire Bible. Uh, for me, it was one of the first ones that I memorized as a small child. And I can still I can still remember going to church and, and putting the little flannel shepherd and sheep on the flannel board, drinking in that imagery and the symbolism of the shepherd and his sheep. It's such a beautiful passage and it and it allows us to think about the, the loving kindness and the care of God who's who's really watching over me. This passage, of course, we can almost infinitely infinitely plumb its depths for applications in the Christian life. For today, I would like to particularly look at some aspects of the 23rd Psalm as they relate to our experience with anxiety. If you're anything like me in my own journey with anxiety, I have certainly had moments where I've asked, what in the world is wrong with me? Why am I not like other Christians? When I was going every, you know, during the darkest time of, of my experience with anxiety, I would be going to church and I would see people praying and singing and they would just be really like in the moment and their faces would just be shining with what seemed like the tangible glory of God. And there I would be feeling anxious just by opening my Bible, feeling anxious by praying, feeling anxious about like literally every aspect of my spiritual life. Um, there definitely was a big aspect of self-doubt, self-criticism of trying to figure out why am I not fixed? You know, the Bible says not to be anxious and I'm trying really hard not to be anxious, but it's not working out the way I thought or maybe as fast as I thought it should. Now, of course, I'll preface our discussion of, of Psalm 23 with the idea that my therapist taught me, which is this concept of secondary disturbance. And we need to be really careful of that when we're, you know, working our way through anxiety. The idea of secondary disturbance is that I have anxiety but then as I go on living my life with this anxiety, I start to get anxiety about the anxiety. I know it sounds a little bit weird. Like secondary disturbance is that I'm depressed, but then I'm depressed about being depressed. I'm anxious about possibly getting triggered by something or, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like this cascade effect that I start to have negative emotions about the fact that I do have negative emotions. And of course, how this applies to our situation with the anxiety is that I can become anxious about the fact that I'm not fixed yet. And if I'm, if, if my struggle actually takes me a little while to solve, I can unfortunately begin interpreting that to mean something. I can interpret that to mean like, oh, well, you still have anxiety. It must mean you're not saved. Oh, you can't quite get over your OCD? Well, that maybe that just means God's not with you. And I can begin making very unhealthy interpretations about my experience that end up making me more anxious. They're not true, and they're just keeping me stuck in that rut of rumination. Now, with that in mind, this idea of secondary disturbances, let's come now to Psalm 23, and let's read a few well-known verses from this chapter. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So here we see that God is leading us in paths of righteousness. Oh, that's great. I like paths of righteousness. That sounds good. He's leading us in these paths of righteousness, but then immediately it segues into what sounds like a very negative experience. All of a sudden we were in this, you know, paths of righteousness, which bring up images of like, you know, fresh breezes and blowing palm trees and soft white sand. And then all of a sudden here I, I, I blink and I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. How in the world did that happen? I thought I was following Jesus in a really nice place. And here I end up in a lot of trial and tribulation. How did this happen? How can it be that if God is leading me, that he's gonna lead me in a dark valley? You know, it's almost reminiscent of um, the New Testament in Matthew chapter four, where after Jesus 
has this incredible experience at the Jordan River where he's baptized and as he comes up out of the water, it's like the heavens open and he hears this voice, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I would love to hear a voice from heaven saying that about me. Like what an amazing experience of affirmation and reassurance from heaven. Moreover, he has the, the spirit come upon him like a dove. It's this amazing moment of, of affirmation to Jesus. But then you turn the page, Matthew chapter four, verse one, and it's like, oh yeah, and the spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's really strange how the switch can take place so quickly. That one moment we're just, you know, skipping along on paths of righteousness, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a dark valley. Jesus is one moment having the, the, the ultimate affirmation of his father, and then it says the spirit drove him or pushed him or compelled him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I really appreciate that when Matthew wrote this, that he included that little phrase that the spirit drove him or led him. Here we know that it's not like Jesus didn't make a mistake by going there and getting tempted by the devil. That it was an act of the spirit who a moment ago just came powerfully upon him. That it was the spirit who compelled him to have this difficult experience. So we have to ask ourselves, why would the good shepherd do that? If he's leading his sheep in these paths of righteousness, why can't he just keep leading them in the easy route? Why does he take them through the valley of the shadow of death? And more importantly, I can ask the question, why would God risk his reputation by doing that? Because you think about it, when God takes us through difficult times, he actually risks being misunderstood in a big way. I've talked to atheists before and they say like, hey, I can't believe in a God who would do A, B, and C. Who would, if he's all powerful and he's all knowing and he's all loving, why would he let little children get abused? Why would he let people lose their spouse in a tragic car accident? Why would he let that happen? And those are very good questions. Why would God allow things that are so crushing to the human spirit that he risks his own reputation, that people can turn against him, that people can misunderstand him, that people can get this picture of God as being this horrible tyrant of someone who hates them. I believe that God is willing to take this risk because he knows the valley of the shadow of death will transform us like nothing else can. There's something about going through hardship that forces us to look honestly at ourselves, to look honestly at God, to, to re-evaluate our experience with life and to double down and develop a deeper walk with God than we could have ever experienced in luxury and relaxation. So God knows that it's a risky experience to allow us to go through trials. He's not just thinking about the pain and agony that it causes us because we know that's part of the equation as well. The Bible tells us that he even counts our tears and he gathers our tears in his bottle. We know he doesn't, he doesn't like that, but he's also calculating the fact that if you go through this, there's the risk that you could gravely misunderstand him and, 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 and see him for somebody that he's not. There's so much at play in the decision-making process when God says, yes, I know that with all these factors combined, all the tears that they're going to shed, all the possible misunderstandings that could temporarily arise, despite all of that, it will be best for her to go through this fire, to go through this dark valley because it will change her like nothing else can, and it will give her a spiritual experience like no other. I want you to notice one other thing about this passage. It says it's the valley of the shadow of death. It's not the valley of death itself. And this is very encouraging to me because it reminds me that I'm not gonna die here. I know that having an anxiety disorder, having depression, having mental health disturbances, I know it's very, very difficult, but you are not going to die here. You're gonna make it out the other side. You're going to find joy and happiness again. Christ will not forsake you here. He is leading you here. He is your good shepherd. So there is absolutely no way that he's gonna let you lay down and breathe your last breath in this valley of the shadow of death. I know it feels like it, 
but he will not forsake you here. Today, I would like to encourage you to try not to get too caught up in the secondary disturbance, which is that, you know, we're getting anxious about the fact that we have anxiety. Instead, let's just be like, okay, I have anxiety. I get weird intrusive thoughts. I have rumination cycles that I can't switch off very easily. Okay, that's what it is. And just stop there. There's no need for interpretations, no need for us to try to pin some uh, elaborate explanation on our anxiety disorder and say, oh, I have anxiety because my spiritual walk is this and that and the other thing. There's no need for that. Just accept the fact that God is leading you and sometimes he takes us through dark valleys. Some, sometimes he does that and we don't always know why, we don't know how long it's going to last, but we know that our good shepherd is leading us and he will not under any circumstance forsake us. So I hope that this brings a little bit of comfort and encouragement to you for your day ahead. Um, may God bless you in whatever tasks are ahead of you. And I will see you back here next Tuesday morning.